Good morning. My name is Mojda Mahdavi. I am a second year Doctor of Design student, and along with my colleagues Liang Wang and Boya Guo, who are also in their second year of DDES program, we would like to welcome you to the Doctor of Design conference, Reform, New Investigations in Urban Form. Doctor of Design is a multidisciplinary research program that encompasses a broad range and combination of theoretical, applied, and technological topics. Common to the diverse range of DDES research investigation is the belief that design research Research makes essential contribution to understanding, analyzing, and improving the built environment in the increasingly complex world. In an attempt to tackle multiple aspects of urbanization, we invited some of the most prominent urban thinkers uh, with actionable knowledge under the frame of annual DDES conference. Organization of this event was possible thanks to intellectual support of our moderators, Professor Charles Waldheim, Professor Neil Brenner, and Professor Diane Davis, and generosity of our sponsors, Harvard uh, GST Advanced Studies Program, History and Philosophy of Design Platform, Dean's Office, Office for Urbanization, MDES Urbanism Landscape Ecology Program, Urban Theory Lab, Center for Green Buildings and Cities, Office for Communications, and China GST. Not to mention that Professor Martin Bechtold, Director of DDES Program, and our Dean Professor Mustafavi have been supporting and inspiring us during months of preparation. We would like to sincerely thank them. And the conference really derives from the common interests and the uh, collective conversation among us and the GSD at large. Uh, it uh, aspires to provoke new investigation, investigations and debates on urban form and its relevance in contemporary urbanizations, specifically by acknowledging the fluctuating conditions of political, economic, and technological contexts and practices, this conference interrogates the meanings of form and its agency in design disciplines and critical thinking. It has been almost half a century uh, since the publication of Henry Lefebvre's <coughs> seminal text, Urban Form, and we see this conference as a timely discussion on this matter, and we hope to gauge such discourse against the urban theory situated within the ongoing urban transitions across the geographies. As we all have noticed in the past three decades, emerging technologies have drastically challenged the idea of urban and its form, ranging in scale from the planetary to the individual. The unprecedented urban complex prioritizes the practice over its agency and therefore obscures the logics of the urban upon which it operates. The processes of contemporary urbanization produce radical phenomena and urban objects, yet prioritizing urban form as an instrument for urbanization remains an elusive notion. It is with this in mind that we believe recovering the discur discursive agency of urban form is a pressing matter. We might not have any definite answers by the end of this conference today, but indeed we hope to address them in a more open, explicit, and inclusive manner. Uh, in terms of the structure of the conference, the conference is consisted of three panels with one closing discussion and one keynote speech. In each panel, we have two panelists. Each of them will give a relatively short 20 minute talk and then we'll open up the floor for any comments, uh, questions, reactions for 50 minutes. Uh, therefore, it is not only about the panelists and moderators, but also about the audience. So please feel free to join the table, not sit behind, and uh, join the discussions. Um, and three panels respond to three topics that we think are urgent and at stake. So panel one, moderated by Professor Charles Wertheim, will respond to, to the question, how might the design disciplines re-establish the agency of form in defining the contemporary urban environment? Panel two, moderated by Professor Neil Brenner, will try to answer, how can we reform the discourse of urban form and reposition such knowledge in debates on contemporary urban theory? Panel three, moderated by Professor Diane Davis, will look at how are the emerging urban practices affecting the means and the future transformation of urbanization and urban form. After panel one, we will, have a, we will take a lunch break. Lunch will be provided to panelists and moderators at Portico, which is room one to three. And after panel two, there will be a coffee break. And after the third panel, we will go directly into the closing discussion hosted by Professor Diane Davis. <laughs> 
After that, we'll have a small reception also in room one to three and keynote speech by Professor Keith Christiani, uh, Christianis will start at 6.30 at Piper Auditorium. And also today, we are glad that Dean Mohsen Mustafavi is with us. So we would love to invite him to give uh, opening remarks to this conference. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, good morning. It's really great to, um, to witness this kind of event happening here um, in the school. I, when I was asked uh, to say a few words, I really wasn't sure what the organizers wanted me to, uh, to speak about, but just sort of reading their uh, notes and um, realizing the kind of urgency of this topic um, I feel that uh, today is going to be really an important day. Um, so thank you for organizing this conference, reform, new investigations, and taking place uh, around this kind of important topic here. And so thank you to Boya, to Mojde, and to Liang, and of course, many thanks to all our speakers for taking the time and, and uh, being here with us. When we talk about uh, the concept of urban form or the discussion of urban form, this topic is in many ways um, inseparable from the history of uh, the GSD in some ways. Because I think, especially for our visitors and maybe for some of our students, it might be worthwhile to say that this history is linked to the foundation of urban design here at the GSD, which is almost 60 years ago. That the urban design program was founded by Jose Luis Sert here at the GSD. And when it was founded, the idea of urban design or thinking about the urban, in some ways separate from the history of the planning program, was to create a practice, a form of doing things uh, in relation to the urban, which was at the intersection of architecture, landscape architecture, and planning. Because these were the departments that were in the school. And urban design then, is not a department, uh, it's not a discipline, but it's thought of as a practice that works across these um, different uh, disciplines here at the, at the school. When the, the idea of urban design here at the GSD uh, was in many ways also linked to the history of Siam, which is the International Congress of Modern Architecture. And for someone like Sert, trying to think about the rebuilding of cities after the Second World War, it was clear that something needed to be done that really dealt with the concept of rebuilding. But his notion of urban design also fundamentally was an architectural one and relied on modern architecture as the device that was used in conjunction with landscape, the idea of open spaces and architecture, as the key ingredients for the formation of the urban. And that has been an important mode of practice, I think, continuing here also at the GSD. But I think today, when we think about the urban, or when we think about urban design, I would say that architecture no longer has the kind of clarity that modern architecture had for CERT. Architecture, to use one of Henri Lefebvre's words, is much more polysemic, but not necessarily in a sort of fecund plurality, but it's also one that is represented through a certain kind of ambiguity. It's unclear what the architecture of the urban is in many ways. It's not quite the same as this clarity of the modern during the time of CERT and the founding of the program. I would say, therefore, the status of architecture in many respects is um, that, of, that of dealing with a kind of scenography, dealing with something which is a kind of placeholder, because contemporary urban design is also, in many ways, negotiating between planning and architecture is dealing with this idea of the middle scale. And therefore, when you're dealing with the middle scale, there is a kind of ambiguity what the architecture will be of the thing that you are designing in this 
moment of middle scale prior to its realization. Perhaps in terms of the conversations today, the work of people like Aldo Rossi and Colin Rowe might come up because those two writers tried to address the question of the urban through two very different lenses. One, in the case of Rossi, through the idea of form, or rather the notion of the urban artifact, that the city is an urban artifact as a thing in terms of its large scale, but it's also this idea of the urban artifact is the thing that is made through architecture as a thing. So there is multiplicity of scale, but both these scales are to do with the role of form and the status of architecture as an artifact. Whereas in the case of someone like Colin Rowe, while he's dealing with the city, the city is much more the city of collage, and the, the idea of the city of collage invariably, because our contemporary city is not Rome of the, uh, of the historic period, but we are dealing with the contemporary city, the, the idea of uh, the urban following the work of someone like Colin Rowe becomes something that actually addresses then the question of appearance. Whereas if Rossi is dealing with form, I think in many ways Colin Rowe is dealing with the notion of context, but context as something that becomes appearance. So since the last 10 years here at the GSD, we've tried to find perhaps a kind of alternative path to this history through a certain set of investigations, whether it's um, under the rubric of planetary urbanization or landscape urbanism or ecological urbanism or infrastructural urbanization or extreme urbanism. All of these have been thought of as the school trying to find ways in which we address the urban through a multiplicity of lenses, none of them by themselves sufficient in terms of addressing really this kind of key problem or problematic of what is the relationship between, in a way, form and the urban, but nevertheless trying to find uh, a lot of kind of rich ground for thinking about the question of the urban. This is why I think that discussions today are really, really critical, because in one sense, reading Henri Lefebvre when Lefebvre talks about form, he doesn't really quite mean the same thing as Aldo Rossi. I mean, he doesn't talk about form as an artifact. His conception of form, and I think, you know, probably I don't know the French text, but I also suspect that the word form has itself multiple meanings in the sense of form as a thing, to form as a way of shaping something, and the concept of formation in France, in French. So those three versions of the thing, the form of something, how one forms something, and when one has formed the concept of formation, are very critical in terms of understanding the role of form today as a way of thinking about the urban, which is somewhere negotiating between the physical, if you like, and the theoretical, or between the physical and the cultural. And I think this dimension of how we should be unfolding, deconstructing, if you like, the word form, um, is going to be very important for the school in many ways in terms of discussions and negotiations between architecture and urban design, in terms of discussions between planning and urban design, but also really in terms of helping us to rethink the kind of roles and possibilities and and new kinds of speculations for what urban design uh, could be, in a way, in the years to come. So I really want to thank the organizers, the DIDES um, students, but also the faculty who've been collaborating uh, to really focus on this kind of key topic, and also thank our speakers for helping us think through this, this important and critical topic throughout the rest of the day. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Thanks, Moisen. Um, so now we have uh, Professor Charles Warheim to introduce the discussion of the first panel. Please, Charles. Good morning. Thanks. Um, thanks very much. Uh, congratulations, Boya, Moshta, Liang. Um, if you look at the DDES conferences, uh, at least over the last several years um, that I've experienced and uh, been able to participate in and learn from, um, it really is an extraordinary, organic, student-organized, um, fairly spontaneous and nimble way um, to track the interests of our doctoral candidates, um, and in that way also to track topics in thinking about um, urban subjects uh, today. Uh, and I'm sure that as we look back at this event in future years, it, it will sit very confidently amongst a range of topics over the last, uh, over the last several. Um, it strikes me um, the theme that we've been given as a provocation is timely for a variety of reasons, some of which are evident in, uh, in the organizer's introduction, some of which are evident uh, in Mosin's remarks. Um, and what I thought I might add to that by way of an introduction to our first two speakers is um, I think in, in many ways in the context of the postmodern return, right, the semantic nightmare is back apparently, um, it gives us a moment to pause and reflect on the debates over the last decade or more. Um, and here at the GSD and in many other contexts, of course, many of us have been dining out on the notion of the externalities, the heretofore conditions in the world that have been uh, perceived to be outside of uh, the disciplinary uh, sphere of architecture or the urban arts. Um, and of course, at the same moment, that itself has been a kind of abstraction or a kind of um, hypothesis that's been well, well productive. It also reaches certain limits. And so I think for me, the topic of form and the proposition of returning to form suggests in many ways the potential of moving past the oppositions between the autonomy of the disciplines in this building, for example, on the one hand, and the conditions in the world, and looking in a much more, let's say, a relational way at that set of conditions, right? Um, and there's maybe in the discussion we can pick up on, on some of those things. Um, um, it's clear that you don't want to reposition the intellectual apparatus of your discipline. You don't want to reconfigure your professional identity and you don't want to reorganize your institutional affiliations every time you have a new hurricane or a new virus in the world. Having said that, if we persist with these disciplinary formations, our intellectual traditions, uh, our professional identities, our institutional formations, irrespective of those conditions in the world, we very rapidly, I would imagine, become um, redundant or, or irrelevant at worst, right? 80 years ago, uh, this university took the decision that in the wake of the economic and political crises of the Great Depression, a restructured uh, formation was, was appropriate, and they invented this school under the rubric of design. And they used design uh, very specifically in the 1930s as a rubric to distance themselves from the historic formation of architecture and landscape architecture and planning. And the sense of their um, professional entanglements not allowing sufficient distance or critical reflection on a set of societal uh, and economic and ultimately political conditions coming out of the 1930s. And so in the 1930s, for this university to use the term design and for us to persist with this over the last eight decades and to name the doctor of design in that same framework is a part of a long-standing uh, dialectic relationship between the conditions in the world, let's say. In this moment uh, today, it's an open question as to what the appropriate language might be, and hopefully our two speakers can help uh, illuminate us uh, a bit about that. Uh, first of all, Nehran Turan. Uh, Nehran is a, an architect, um, an urbanist. Uh, she is, uh, in addition to um, an architect graduate from uh, Istanbul, uh, a graduate of uh, Yale University and a holder of the Doctor of Design from the Graduate School of Design. Uh, her practice, Neem Studio, has been quite significant in recent years. And uh, her talk on the planetary, invoking the Lefebvrean uh, conversation in the school of the last several years, 
in relationship to architecture, I think will be an excellent beginning. Um, what I could say about Neron's work as an academic is that her work has been widely published and widely read. She's an international figure. And at the same moment, uh, her practice uh, that she'll refer to in some of her projects, I think, have been quite significant uh, these days in reframing potential relationships between uh, these conditions in the world and the potential for uh, a position within architecture and urbanism. Please welcome Neron to her. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Charles. Thanks to the uh, uh, organizers and the school for having me here. It's such a pleasure, obviously, to be back. Um, I would like to think together with you today uh, on the following question. Considering our current political crisis around climate change, what can architecture contribute toward a new planetary imaginary of our contemporary environment beyond environmentalism and technological determinism? Instead of limiting the role of climate change for design merely to a problem to solve, can we speculate on architecture as a measure against which the environment might be read? My presentation today will elaborate on these questions and the disciplinary cultural potentials of such provocations. Main argument of my talk will be that architecture needs an alternative kind of environmental imagination that is able to see the categories of the quotidian and the planetary in conversation with one another. This argument both alludes to a possible discussion on the agency of form as it relates to architecture urbanism, but expands this discussion by framing form as one of the many aspects of the quotidian. In his recent book titled, After Nature, A Politics for the Anthropocene, law professor Jadidiah Purdy provides a critical framework for us. Instead of offering a universalizing ethical claim for the Anthropocene or using it to give a totalizing theory, Purdy provides a compelling agenda calling for an indispensable cultural shift in our understanding of the idea of environment. He writes, quote, environment needed to be invented before it could be saved during the 60s and 70s. Despite its scientific trappings, the idea of Anthropocene is mainly a cultural idea, and its potential is political and ethical. It is the starting place for a new politics of nature, a politics more encompassing and imaginative than what we have come to know as environmentalism." Unquote. Purdy's formulations are refreshing for two reasons. First is his consideration of the idea of environment as a conceptual invention that needs to be decoupled from environmentalism. Second is his call to see the Anthropocene as a cultural and political idea instead of a solely technological or scientific matter. I would like to argue today that such shifts are equally imperative within the architectural field today. In parallel to the recent debates on climate change, the contemporary architectural imaginary of our environment is mostly limited to the following pervasive positions, which are poised to lose their critical relevance. First is the attempt to see the environment as nature, as something to be saved and protected, mixed with feelings of guilt, as well as good intentions of ethical responsibility to go back to a more innocent state, imagining environment as purely nature lacks necessary humility and embracement of our contemporary condition. The problem with this view is that if we as humans are intervening on everything on Earth, from the upper atmosphere to the deep seas, and the nature as we know it is something else altogether with human intervention all over it, it is difficult to argue for the preservation of an idea of nature that is defined by its purity and redemption. Second position comes with positivist and managerial tendencies, which prioritize questions such as efficiency, technofix, problem solving, and see the environment as system. Revealing the desire to control the problems of climate change with almost heroic extreme of earth mastering with geoengineering projects, imagining environment simply as a system represents our, our anthropocentric anesthesia. Third are attempts that see the environment as earth, which translate planetary imagination almost literally as the portrayal of the earth itself. Centered on the disintegration of our planetary hinterland due to the ecological outcomes of urbanization, seeing environment as, as Earth limits the scope with a scalar bias for the large. 
Our current political crisis in relation to climate change reflects all these attitudes and their various combinations as it is stuck between the sleepwalking of skeptics or deniers on the one hand and the overpowering desires of geoengineering on the other. Instead of conceptualizing then the idea of environment as purely natural that needs to be protected, as solely systemic that needs to be mastered and managed, or merely as earth that limits the scope with a scale bias, can we think of another kind of planetary imagination for architecture? In light of the incomprehensibility of the inhuman scale of climate change and related scientific data combined with architecture's inherent capacity to illustrate spatial consciousness, architecture's specific contribution to this discussion might seem as a problem of visualization. However, for architecture, planetary imagination should not simply mean how to best visualize the planet. Instead of turning architecture's agency to a visualization project for the damaged planet, a much more broader question might be at stake. How does one talk about, communicate, and practice an architectural aesthetics of planetary imagination? Posing the question this way would not only require a more ambitious discourse that deals with the relationship between politics of content and the politics of appearance, but also would allow us to build more meaningful relationships between what is considered to be the, the quotidian or familiar for architecture and the planetary or the unfamiliar. All of which takes me to this image. Taken during, during a scientific expedition, this photograph is from the remote Henderson Island, which lies in the Pacific Ocean, halfway between New Zealand and Chile. Henderson Island was named as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1988 for depicting, quote, its rare ecology that is practically untouched by human presence, unquote. When Henderson Island was again a focus of attention in 2015 as part of a research looking into the South Pacific gyre, however, the researchers found more than 55,000 pieces of human-made trash, fishing gear, water bottle, toys, etc., largely made of plastic deposited by ocean with peak intensity density of plastic debris recorded anywhere in the world. The image of an immense collection of a wide array of plastic objects depicted in an un quote unquote untouched remote island not only staged confrontations for our material politics of accumulation at a post-natural moment, but also point to a puzzling fact. Similar to a plastic straw from a dinner table, ending as a trash on this remote island, the trash seen at the Henderson Island depicts the quotidian and the planetary as one of the very same category. For the fields of environmental humanities, environmental history, eco-criticism, science technology studies, these kinds of links might be self-evident, but from an architectural standpoint, the planetary and the familiar still belong to two separate discourses. Our inability to build significant linkages between the planetary and the quotidian might be related to our limited interpretation for the idea of realism, which relies heavily on the material and the representational aspects of climate change. The material attitudes reflect the desire to respond to the physical realities of climate change, while the representational attitudes are concerned with visualization and calling attention. Both of these attitudes have been with us since the 90s, with discussions on agency and realism in relation to urbanism. Positioned against the representational emphasis of the previous generation of postmodern architecture, this realism of the 90s had shifted the focus to the material systems and infrastructures of the city, with calls for instrumentality and pragmatism, a realism in which the role of representation had been mostly interpreted as data mapping or infographics. Fast forward more than two decades, reducing architecture's agency to a realism of problem solving or visualization makes it difficult to see climate change as a problem of cultural and political imagination. My recent work aims to provoke such an environmental imagination that sees the categories of the quotidian and the planetary in conversation with one another by presenting a set of unconventional collisions between architecture and climate change, which all extrapolate broader concerns of urbanism, environment, and geography through the lens of specific architectural questions, such as form, representation, and materiality.
these collisions not only stage and reflect on the critical issues of our present condition, but perhaps more importantly, aspire to resituate architecture's engagement with the world through a different kind of realism. A realism that aims to build these relationships between the quotidian and the planetary on the one hand, and the material and representational on the other. Here, I'm less interested in the potential of these collisions as a project of another disciplinary expansion for architecture. Instead, my ambition is to propose a different and nuanced attention and another, another kind of inner focus or specificity for architecture. And by doing that, to reboost architecture's geocosmic effect by collapsing the centers and the peripheries of the discipline, by colliding its very outside with its very core interior. Here, um, I'm showing you an earlier project titled Museum of Lost Volumes, which tackles such questions as a geo-architecture fiction and a satire commentary on resource extraction. Museum of Lost Volumes provides an alternative focus on the mining of rare earth minerals. Rare earth minerals are the backbone substance and the unique commodity that are used in quote-unquote green technologies such as wind turbines, electric batteries, solar panels, laptops, electrical vehicles. And the project speculates on the future controversies of resource scarcity in the abundance of green technologies. It imagines a museum of ancient resource extraction ruins for a time when mining is an obsolete practice and treated similarly to an ancient monument or an extinct species to be housed in a natural history museum. In the context of the debates on climate change and Anthropocene, the Museum of Lost Volumes project positions architecture both as a background and as a measure against which the world might be read. Measuring here, measuring here is at once to a certain degree by using an instrument, and at another is to scrutinize, to consider with pause and inner focus. Like architecture, then, this project represents the world back to itself. <coughs> another example would be our Nine Islands project, originally prepared for the third Istanbul Design Biennial, titled Are We Human? in 2016, created by Beatrice Colomina and Mark Wigley. Here, in this project, this project engages with the very collision of the architectural and geographic, this time by focusing on the under-conceptualized temporal and spatial long span of architectural materiality. A long span that helps us to understand buildings as piles of matter and stuff, which all circulate and construct before and around the building, and participate within a complicated array of logistics, supply chains, from quarries to processing facilities to construction assemblies, etc., and finally to its demolition, waste, and decomposition. First aspect of this long span is spatial, which renders the polit politics and territories of resource geographies. An article we encountered during our research created an important background for the project. It was a 1972 architectural design article on then recently built 50-story One Shell Plaza in Houston, describing the lavish materials coming from every part of the planet for the building, ranging from primavera mahoney wood from Guatemala, Italian travertine quarried near Rome, and Persian walnut wood from Iran. Among these, the article's description of one particular material drew our attention the most. For the 26 elevator caps of the building that each had nine feet walls covered with re real leather, the article wrote that, quote, the architects wanted no seams or joints horizontally, so they had to search the world for nine-foot cows, unquote, the biggest at the time. This led us to question how we understand materials of architecture in relation to resource geographies today. So Nine Islands Project engages with the question of long span from a material point of view. It consists of an archipelago of nine islands presented through five feet tall models on pedestals, each complemented by one drawing. Each island represents a particular lavish or widely used building material, such as we had to include leather, leather, marble, wood, glass, styrofoam, etc. 
The upper part of each model consists of a monument, an archetypical building mass that is finished with a specific material. As an opposition to the upper part, the lower part of each model consists of a rock, a formless landmass from which the raw matter is ex extracted. Here you see the project assembled as an installation. The stark contrast between the finished surfaces of the archetypical forms at the top with the vulgar formlessness of the naked resource origins below aims to call attention to the long span in between. A similar double register is used in the drawings of the project. Consisted of two parts, each drawing of the project depicts two different snapshots from the long span of one of the nine materials. While the upper part of each drawing positions one building material through a particular architectural lens, elevation, section, plan, specification, detail, the lower part depicts a daily life scene from the wider lifespan of the same material. Extraction at the quarry, shipping at the container port, demolition of the building, management of the waste mound in the Pacific Ocean, for styrofoam on the left, for instance, or roofing at the construction site, etc. As the upper drawings depict architectural spaces as still lifes with detailed traces of everyday life, but without the actual presence of humans, the lower drawings showcase overpopulated human activity and presence in the extraction, transportation, construction, or waste site. So that was our interpretation for the word, are we human? The geographies that are depicted in the Nine Island project lie outside of ecology's focus on the natural and the wilderness landscapes or urbanism's focus on the city, but they play a central role in the production and conception of what is known to us as the built environment. In that light, the project calls for an architectural imagination that not only stages these landscapes, but also juxtaposes that planetary imagination with the extremely quotidian aspects in relation to the material practice of architecture. Here are some other drawings for uh, the travertine and aluminum, for instance. Here, similar to the representational techniques of split paintings of the 16th and 17th century, or simply as they were called, painting within a painting, which split the picture plane into two scenes and juxtaposes the two very contrasting techniques of representation on the same picture plane. Here, the illusionism of still life of everyday objects in the foreground and the traditional picturalized religious history of the sacred in the background. The drawings of the Nine Island Project make possible for two vent points of the same reality coexist on the space of representation. Is that an alarm for the... Oh, okay. I thought it was 32 minutes. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> but that still helps me too. <laughs> okay, so um, all of which leads me to the last project that expands on these questions, the representational questions in a different way. The Middle Earth Dioramas for the Planet project imagines, imagines a museum of post-natural history for an era in which climate of the Earth has already changed, an era in which the idea of nature belongs to us, the ancient humans. A museum that displays dioramas, which depict sceneries from this post-natural world. The project is a speculative architecture proposal situated at the coordinates of the zero longitude, zero latitude, the exact location on Earth where the equator crosses the prime meridian near the Gulf of Guinea in Africa. Each diorama displays a specific problem brought by climate change, especially taking place at the middle of the Earth, around the equator, the Earth's zero degree latitude, the melting of the icebergs, deforestation in Brazil and Indonesia, plastic waste in the Pacific Ocean, sand mining in Singapore and e-waste dump sites in Ghana. The museum is made of an awful lot of many rooms, each containing large-scale diorama. Each of these rooms act as an environmental archive, a cabin of a curiosity in relation to climate change. First room is of the museum is titled Theaters of Deforestation. It's a large room containing dioramas that depict the deforestation process in Brazil and Indonesia around the zero degree latitude. Second room of the museum is the Plastic Pacific Hall. The room contains a large diorama that portrays the plastic trash collected in the Pacific Ocean. In addition to staging real issues of climate change, the dioramas of this museum are in a state of construction or maintenance. In this way, the activities taking place both inside and around the diorama destabilize the idealism about the conception of nature and its restaging as a three-dimensional image. In this museum, both the idea of nature, 
and of image are both deemed as susceptible. Similar to photographer Richard Barnes' work that collapses distinctions between the artifice of appearance and nature in his diorama photographs, the project opens up a space of inquiry in between. Here are two photographs that were very, very, I think we were very inspired by these photographs. Third room was named as the Room of Icebergs, which contained a large diorama that displayed the melting of the icebergs and their drift to the coastal regions around the Earth's real degree latitude. Fourth room is named the giant triptych of air conditioning, a diorama which depicted the extravagant use of air conditioning around the world's zero degree latitude. Each frame depicted the use of air conditioning in relation to the daily activities of the ancient humans. So let me wrap up. I think I'm close to 20 minutes. Instead of associating realism directly with mere depiction of reality, Middle Earth understands realism as an aesthetic tension created between the reality itself and its representation. While taking its cues from the real events and facts of our environmental conditions, Middle Earth slightly abstracts or defamiliarizes these realities with the use of a very familiar art artifact, in this case diorama, in order to push the limits of our public and disciplinary imagination about our contemporary urbanism and environment. Thank you. Thanks, Neron. Um, at about the 18 minute mark, I leaned over to Pier Vittorio and said, we got a good start, we have plenty of time. We can take 30 minutes. And then the duck went off and everything kind of compressed. So I would say things are, um, things are, things are going well so far. Uh, thank you, Neron. What, for me, um, if, if, if Neron's you know, provocation begins with political crisis and climate change, and then drills from that down into questions of material economy and uh, hence then disciplinary formation and reception, um, maybe it would be fair to say that um, our next speaker's work um, works that dialectic in the other direction, beginning with questions of disciplinary formation, autonomy, um, and then toward questions of uh, conditions adjacent to the field, let's say. Pier Vittori Aureli um, studied architecture uh, in Venice, uh, and then at the Berlaga Institute uh, in Rotterdam. Um, he is uh, author of many essays uh, and books on a variety of topics around questions of architecture, autonomy, and the urban. Um, you may have uh, seen, for example, The Project of Autonomy 2008, or The Possibility of an Absolute Architecture 2011, both of which have been you know, widely read uh, internationally and certainly have been well consumed and discussed here in this building. Aureli is uh, with Martino Tatara, co-founder of Dogma, um, a very significant practice working out of Europe these days and with uh, an equally illustrious uh, array of awards and recognition as have uh, Nehran received. Um, most recently, you've seen the publication of their monograph, uh, Dogma 11 Projects. Um, Pier Vittorio today is going to begin with a provocation, returning in some ways to the perennial topic of the grid uh, and the grid in relationship to urban form uh, over time and through which um, I'm hopeful that we might be able to come back to questions of the relationship between the formation of the grid and questions of appropriation and ultimately even uh, ownership and, and politics. Please welcome Piratoria Aureli. Okay, um, good morning. Thanks uh, for the introduction, Charles, and of course, thanks to the organizer for inviting me. Um, the title of my presentation is um, The Grid and the Island, but I have to warn you that most of the presentation will be on the grid, uh, and I will only address the island at the very end uh, because it's, it's a work in progress, so I still have more questions than, than answers. Uh, the urban grid is perhaps uh, the most ubiquitous uh, and resilient uh, urban form uh, uh, in history. Uh, from cartography to urbanism uh, to architecture, we see, understand, and construct the world by inscribing it uh, within grids. Uh, yet, while the grid has been amply discussed as a formal, um, functional, and cultural figure, in my opinion, uh, its political significance uh, has remained uh, opaque at least, let's say, within the discipline of architecture and, and urban design. So um, in order, actually, to uh, counter uh, this opaqueness, uh, 
What I will do in this presentation, I will uh, propose a very brief and concise uh, genealogy. Um, and uh, the argument of this genealogy, let's say the thesis that I would like to put forward, uh, uh, is that uh, in, the, in the history of the grid, at least uh, within, um, of course, uh, the Western um, interpretation of this uh, uh, spatial uh, apparatus, uh, the fundamental goal uh, is actually the stabilization and the enforcement of land ownership. Uh, and this actually um, process uh, is achieved through uh, the three operations. The first one uh, is appropriation. In a way, the history of uh, uh, urbanization is a history of appropriation. I mean, every, um, let's say, uh, form of settlement has always appropriated the uh, land, often in actually very violent uh, uh, way, by evicting actually those who were living there and working there before. And so the grid has always been used as a way to stabilize uh, basically this uh, moment of appropriation. The second uh, uh, operation, uh, which is I, I would say the most important one, uh, is the operation of subdivision. And I would argue that in the history of urban form, subdivision is perhaps the most important uh, moment in which actually urban form is uh, produced. And then the third operation uh, is abstraction. Uh, meaning the uh, trans translation of the land, of the contingency of the land into patrimonial and often uh, financial uh, values. So uh, I would like to actually uh, unfold, unravel uh, this uh, process uh, by going back uh, into history and offering, as I said before, a very concise uh, genealogy uh, of this uh, uh, process. Um, going back to history, actually, we can trace back uh, the origin of the grid as a subdividing uh, uh, instrument uh, in a fundamental shift uh, that actually has not yet been completed, uh, that happened uh, uh, between actually the, uh, in, the, in the course of history uh, with the advent of uh, sedentary uh, uh, communities. Uh, and this shift can actually be uh, really seen the passage from, uh, in, in terms of architecture, from circular uh, uh, house layouts uh, to rectangular house layouts. As you might know, actually, with the rise of sedentism, uh, agriculture becomes a very important uh, form of economy, uh, which actually generates also surplus. Uh, and so the house actually is no longer a place of ritual and, uh, let's say, um, uh, shelter, but it's also a place of accumulation uh, of uh, persons, but also uh, goods. And it's exactly for that reason that in many uh, communities and civilizations, uh, the rectangular form uh, becomes much more uh, important and preeminent to the circular form because it really allowed in a more efficient way the subdivision of the house into different, uh, into different spaces, as you can see actually in this very famous example of the cell building in Chayanu uh, in uh, Turkey. And of course, the history of uh, Neolithic uh, houses, uh, you can say, especially in the in the Southwest uh, Asia uh, is actually a history of further subdivision from the one-room house to the multi-room house. And, well, in fact, the management of the household becomes a fundamental operation of constructing the household not just as, as a place of coexistence, but also as a place of power. And of course, with the urban revolution uh, that happened in the, third mil in the fourth millennium uh, BCE, uh, the uh, impetus of, of subdivision goes beyond the household and invests actually uh, the entire uh, territory, especially with the introduction of uh, uh, animal drone uh, plowing, uh, but also with more efficient system of irrigations, uh, like for example, the introduction of the long field, uh, where in fact uh, uh, the parceling of land is not just a, a matter of cultivating land, but also establishing unit of measures through which actually production can be assessed uh, as a finan economic uh, and financial uh, uh, asset. And actually, it's interesting that it's exactly at the time that writing itself uh, is actually introduced in the form of cuneiform uh, writing. And it's in almost interesting to see how the abstraction uh, of the grid, in a way, really, um, it's ubiquitous, actually, goes actually from land to actually uh, writing itself, which was often used uh, as a way to store uh, information and data about uh, production and uh, economy. Actually, uh, Herodotus, uh, in reading the origin of uh, geometries, Herodotus said that uh, the Egyptians uh, invented geometry in order to stretch uh, the rope to build uh, temples, granaries, 
but most importantly to re, uh, reparcel uh, the land after the seasonal flood uh, of the Nile. Um, and of course, uh, it's a very uh, uh, narrative uh, ex this explanation of the origin of geometry, which might not be invented by the Egyptians, but actually is a good reminder how uh, the imposition of a geometric order to the land, uh, and in fact, the, the development of geometry itself as an art of measuring the earth, uh, is very much um, uh, connected to the possibility to measure the land in order to transform it into an economic uh, uh, datum. And in fact, I would argue that geometry has much more to do with money than uh, with form. Um, and of course, this uh, geometric understanding of the territory unfold not only uh, land, but also the making of uh, cities. Uh, for example, in the uh, uh, Middle Kingdom, uh, in Egypt, uh, there is this phenomena of, uh, of building, actually, uh, colonial uh, towns, uh, especially made for uh, workers, specialized workers along the Nile uh, Valley, where in fact the grid becomes an instrument to measure not just uh, the building material and the economic resources, but also the labor force that was necessary in order to colonize uh, this uh, uh, valley that became in fact uh, uh, the state that in fact became the Egyptian state of the Middle Kingdom. And in fact, I would argue from these very early examples that here we see really the emergence of what I would call uh, a colonial urbanism. And I would say that uh, urbanism, by definition, has always been uh, colonial. Uh, this actually is very much uh, evident, uh, of course, uh, in the uh, urbanism of uh, ancient Rome, the most maybe, perhaps obvious example. I mean, after the 6th century uh, BC, when Rome uh, initiated its aggressive campaign of conquest, a fundamental method to colonize uh, the land was not just uh, warfare, but also the subdivision of land uh, into parcels to be actually given by uh, veterans. Uh, Rome was a constant belligerent uh, state, so veterans have to be rewarded uh, after their, uh, let's say, duties, but also to soldiers themselves, because to be a soldier in the Roman army, you had to own property. And here you really see the beginning of this uh, fundamental link between uh, property uh, and uh, military uh, conquest. And in fact, a crucial figure uh, of this, uh, uh, let's say, process were the agreement sores, the surveyors, who actually were uh, very experienced in geometry, uh, but also uh, in law. And their work actually, although was for uh, civilian uh, uh, purposes, their work was actually paid by the army. And in fact, uh, uh, with the Roman colonial urbanism, we really see this blurring between the civilian and the military uh, dimension of, uh, of planning, of planning itself, which really has blurred this kind of distinction that we often assume as, a, as a something that uh, still has a, has a different uh, uh, end or different purpose. It is exactly this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, modus of appropriation that uh, the Romans uh, transformed not only into uh, a spatial appropriation, but also in a juridical uh, apparatus. And this is actually a very important aspects of the way in which uh, the land uh, uh, and the appropriation of land was stabilized by the transformation of the land uh, into uh, res. Uh, of course, res uh, is a word that, as you might know, means a thing, but thing not as, a, as an object, but as an economic uh, uh, entity. And of course, uh, the Romans actually used this word uh, to address anything that could become uh, identifiable as an economic or patrimonial uh, object. But it's interesting to see how the word dress was especially used to address land, the status of land. And of course, uh, the idea of uh, res publica and res privata in the Roman uh, uh, law was uh, more or less a matter of patrimonial uh, ownership. So res publica was something that was belonging to the state and as such couldn't be uh, trade, while res privata was something that could have been trade. That was the ultimate meaning of uh, public, uh, res, public, uh, res public and res uh, uh, privata. It is exactly this kind of understanding of the relationship between law uh, and property that was uh, resurrected in the Middle Age, uh, when in fact Europe, uh, before to start the process of colonizing uh, elsewhere, start to actually colonize uh, itself, started to reclaim its own territory as a state. And one of the most interesting uh, formation of that moment, uh, completely overlooked uh, in many history of urban design, is actually the French Bastide, uh, which were 
towns uh, that were neither villages uh, nor cities. They were uh, founded by a contract made between the king and a cartel of uh, landowners, which often were either abbots or feudal lords. Once this contract was established, uh, this cartel would attract uh, residents. And the revenue uh, out of this, uh, let's say, enterprise was the taxation uh, of those actually who were living and working uh, uh, in these towns, taxation in terms of land, but also in terms of, uh, in terms of work. And it's exactly this, and of course the grid here becomes instrumental because it was speeding up construction. Often these uh, pastilles were founded in very hostile uh, territories. Uh, so it was also bringing a, a potential reservoir army eventually to defend uh, the territory. But also uh, the grid was instrumental to the precise subdivisions in order to avoid the property conflicts, uh, which actually were extremely uh, contentious, as you might know, in the Middle Age. And it's exactly this uh, model that becomes the fundamental modus operandi of the colonial urbanism uh, in the Americas, where in fact, uh, even more than warfare, I would argue property becomes the instrument, the violent instrument of uh, appropriation. And in fact, uh, uh, property is not simply possession of land. Uh, property means that there is a legal apparatus that gives the power to the owner to use and to exclude uh, by law, not by his own custom, uh, that land. And in fact, we, shouldn't, we don't need to read uh, Marx, uh, Carl Schmitt, uh, or Benjamin to understand that there is nothing more violent, uh, ultimately violent, than law uh, itself. And this is exactly why um, the Natives American, uh, this is actually a very interesting map from the 18th century, started to perceive the threat uh, of colonial uh, urbanism by identifying two means of occupy the land, the, the grid that you see actually on the, on the left, which is, was an imposition not just of boundaries and walls, but an imposition of property rights, and actually the uh, nations uh, of native uh, Americans who actually had a completely different system of land tenure, which was still based on boundaries, but these boundaries were not defined by, uh, cast, uh, by law, but by uh, custom. And in fact, uh, uh, here we really have to stress that the fundamental modus operandi of this colonial urbanism, as Gary Field has uh, said, was not actually warfare, but in fact, lawfare. And I would say that this is one of the fundamental problem of urban design, because uh, urban design really um, rely a lot, actually, on the law that is established and that contains its operation. Of course, needless to say that this uh, was exactly the modus operandi of the construction uh, of the United States as an urban system through the famous 1785 land uh, ordinance, uh, which actually, as you might know, as you know for sure, was based on Thomas Jefferson uh, hundreds, uh, where uh, in fact the land was subdivided in multiples of 10, uh, also because, uh, as you know very well, Jefferson was obsessed by the use of decimal systems and something that he introduced, for example, in currency. And this really shows how the organization of the land was immediately thought in terms of its patrimonial uh, organization, its own, let's say, financial uh, value. And this is exactly the, the, the aspect you know, that always backfire projects uh, that uh, are willfully using the grid as their own uh, system of organization. I mean, one of the most interesting cases, of course, is the Ildefonso Cerda uh, plan of Barcelona, 1859, which became the basis of his fundamental book, uh, The General Theory of Urbanization. And as you might know, Cerda really uh, put forward circulation uh, as the fundamental driving force uh, of urbanization. And so the concept of intervia uh, became a fundamental asset uh, of his own uh, modus operandi. In terms of urban design, the, in Cerda terms, the intervia would bring together private and public stakeholders uh, and, uh, in order to formulate a coherent project, uh, uh, an urban uh, plan. I mean, in a way, he, he anticipated the uh, uh, famous or infamous public-private uh, partnership. But uh, as you might, and of course, uh, the plan in terms of uh, density and distribution of resources was uh, relatively uh, generous. But what happened, because insufficient funding, uh, uh, the city of Barcelona was, uh, the plan was taken over by private uh, uh, investor, which actually 
dramatically increase the density. Uh, they even privatize uh, certain parts of the city. And again here, the grid uh, worked perfectly as an instrument of subdivision in order to split the land uh, into different uh, uh, parts. Uh, something similar happened with another interesting uh, proposal, which was never uh, a real project, but a very influential, actually, design uh, exercise in the formation, really, of our discipline of urban design, which is uh, Louis Kahn traffic studies for uh, Philadelphia, which actually were put forward at the very crucial moment that was actually uh, mentioned before, uh, the urban renewal. Uh, a, a project that uh, had the official agenda to reclaim uh, downtown areas uh, between the 1950s and the 1980s in order to revitalize them uh, in the face of the flight of middle class uh, to suburbia. We know, of course, that the agenda of uh, urban renewal was a massive uh, act of dispossession uh, of people who are living uh, in the city center, especially Afro-American uh, communities. Uh, it's interesting to see how, uh, what kind of interpretation uh, Khan uh, wittingly or unwittingly gave of this process by focusing only on circulation. He proposed a plan where, in fact, the civicness of the city was addressed by orchestrating uh, the different traffic flows that, in fact, made uh, uh, the urban uh, uh, fabric, uh, constructing this kind of very poetic interpretation of the city through the arbors uh, and the uh, and the reverse. But in fact, uh, uh, we know that uh, this process of uh, reconstructing the traffic uh, flows uh, of the city was very geared uh, in, in the process of urban renewal to increase land value and land property because, of course, uh, pedestrian uh, friendly life was uh, considered very beneficial to commercial and tertiary uh, activities. And so we see actually how even if urban design and urbanism is abstracted only as a matter of logistics and circulation, property actually remain the fundamental condition sine qua non of how actually urban form is generated, is produced. So the question is what kind of counter figure or counter uh, paradigm we can think uh, outside of the way, the, the, the logic, the perverse logic of subdivision that has in fact uh, construct uh, uh, the city, not, not just actually the city, but the entire entirety of the urban uh, territory. I would actually propose uh, uh, as, a, as a possible, as a potential, counterfigure the idea of the island, uh, and not just as a kind of finite uh, settlement form, but also uh, as, a, as a place where uh, different modes of uh, possession and uh, appropriation of land be beyond ownership can be uh, established. And as such, the, the island actually uh, is not actually an, an enclosure, uh, but is always open to uh, external uh, influences. Uh, the island actually, uh, it's a, a place where the distinction within public and private often uh, is suspended, and new modes of coexistence can be uh, tested. And also, unlike actually uh, the grid, uh, the island doesn't uh, uh, claim a universal law in order to uh, exist, but actually its uh, mode of coexistence is based on custom and use, use actually against uh, uh, ownership. In the last uh, uh, minute of my presentation, I just would like to um, go through a few examples, a contemporary example of, uh, that I believe uh, are uh, fundamental for uh, imagining the future and the evolution of this figure. Uh, one that definitely, uh, for me, is very important was the model of the Spanish uh, Acampada, uh, which, as you might know, was a, an occupation of public space that me actually uh, really tried to portray it as an ephemeral uh, temporary event. But whoever actually have been there knew that uh, the people who were occupying this space were really trying to exercise new forms of dwelling uh, and new forms of actually of life uh, beyond the uh, distinction uh, between public and private uh, that is the fundamental juridical apparatus uh, of uh, uh, subdivision. Uh, and of course, a very important aspect of this uh, occupation was also the theatrical form of the square, which of course was designed for completely different reasons, but in this case really amplify the rituality uh, of occupying space, and I really believe that rituals are a fundamental resource uh, to counter the abstraction of the, le of, of, of the law and to profanate, actually, this legal uh, abstraction. Another example that I think is really relevant to our discussion of urban form 
where the forms of resistance to where uh, state uh, public private projects uh, to completely um, uh, let's say uh, optimize the territory in order for the sake of profit uh, one of the most uh, for me interesting example which you all know uh, was the sacred stone camp at standing uh, rock in north dakota where in fact uh, uh, people, the Native uh, Americans and other activists were really trying to uh, stop the building of a pipeline that would uh, move oil from north to south, uh, trying to really obstruct this process of urbanization and reclaiming actually this land uh, as something that was not actually, um, that was even beyond, in fact, the possibility of the state to dictate its own, uh, its own law. So I really believe that these are still it's still the beginning of a new way of thinking uh, the territory that goes beyond uh, the fundamental paradigm of subdivision that I think is re really the uh, fundamental problem of the contemporary uh, city. And I believe that any progressive reflection on the future of urban forms should really depart from these examples to rethink its, even its own disciplinary uh, uh, terms of action. Thank you. Thanks very much for that pubertorial. Um, fantastic provocation. Um, we're going to spend most of our time um, over the course of the next 40 minutes or so entertaining your questions in a kind of discursive form. But I do want to give a chance for anybody who is standing back there and doesn't want to be. There's plenty of chairs over here. Please make yourself comfortable. If you don't have a seat, please, please join us. Um, so islands, who knew? I, I was prepared for grids um, and material economies. Um, I want to return to my initial, um, my initial interest in which um, Mehran gives us a first paper beginning with crisis, political crisis coming from environmental uh, exigency. And then very quickly, I think, pivots from that to then drill down into disciplinary formation what does this mean um, for those of us that work in these fields in architecture, in urban thought? Um, and ultimately, I think, it, if I'm correct, and tell me um, if I misread this, um, we arrive at the idea of ways in which the architectural imaginary might be productive outside of this building, or ways in which, or forms through which, I think that was the original formulation of the paper, that is, how can architecture imagine the planetary and somehow change the terms of that conversation outside of these walls or outside of this disciplinary formation? Um, and at the same moment, for me, then brings us to the kind of material substrate um, that underpins architectural work. Um, and using, more often than not, in addition to islands, um, the metaphor or the model of the museum, the curatorial frame, the diorama, the idea that we will present back to ourselves um, the both material and environmental conditions. Um, on the other hand, you know, Pierre Vittorio's paper really begins with something that is you know, central to disciplinary formation, right? And a broad, and fundamental to both our habits of thought, our ways of organizing uh, our field, and then very, very quickly pivots to deal with almost everything in the, in the history of, of the West. Uh, right, it comes to uh, circumscribe almost everything. And so two very provocative papers, quite compelling. Um, for me, the, the first question, um, Neron, for you is, can you say something more about, um, if, if I have it right, the kind of curatorial museological frame, the architectural imaginary for other fields, can you say something more about that and how might the architectural imaginary be relevant or useful outside of the design disciplines? Um, I think that there is a, almost a, oh, I forced myself to remain in 20 minutes and curated, like there was also a curator, curatorial aspect in my presentation of picking some projects which now uh, kind of read a certain way. It's, it's almost, I, I have to say though that there, it's a double-sided coin. One is my interest in how architectural imagination provokes public imagination, meaning uh, even not in only other disciplines, but almost like opening it up. There are capacities to provoke certain imaginations, but also I think it's an internal, uh, let's say, dialogue as well, in the sense that it's not only, I think the audience is not just other disciplines, but also how does it um, allow us, for instance, the Nine Islands project, uh, you know, that 
all of them all of them are speculative projects in the sense that they are not normative projects in the sense that there's no proposal to build something on the site but that doesn't mean that that's not the let's say goal i think that at the end of the day the other side of the coin is well what happens when we are aware of these questions what what happens if we are aware of the material economy of a building and understand that a building is a stuff, do we keep drawing these kinds of things or does it really inform the way that we conceptualize buildings? So I'm more, I'm really actually interested in the next steps of that provocation instead of just, you know, seeing this as a calling attention to, you know, a point that would provoke an imagination. The reason I say that is, I was actually really interested in Jedediah Diapardi's uh, work, which I mentioned in the beginning in terms of the Anthropocene, not only because of the climate change and um, his you know, interesting interpretation of environmental imagination, but also he's, because he's from law, he's a law professor. His interpretation, and he, there's a quote, I can, we can really have a, I think, a session on the book or his provocations, I think. But there's a part where he says, I'm interested in the word imagination than ideas. <laughs> He, I prefer the word imagination instead of ideas, and he sees law as exactly we see architecture. For him, law is a measure because for him, he is talking about in the United States how environment was imagined and what kind of laws were created and then what kind of policies were created after that. And he sees law really, he says that, well, we imagine certain things and we create law, laws and then we implement. So in a certain way for me, um, I think that law, there are laws in urban planning, but there are also laws and procedures and codes. I mean, building codes, all that boring stuff that kind of really, uh, let's say, defines practice, right? In this country, it's even more than, you know, maybe uh, present than in other countries. But, but that, well, when I say planetary and quotidian, quotidian for me also embraces those things. It's not just the material economy. It would be the laws and the regulations and codes that make up uh, our practices and have certain assumptions about what environment is. Mm -hmm. So it's a double-sided kind of thing in terms of provoking other disciplines, but also looking back on ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, in that sense, I mean, I think both papers are really um, quite extraordinary reflections on the conditions for our own work, right? One material, uh, one legal. So we have islands, we have laws. Um, it also strikes me that um, in many ways, I think both papers can be read as a kind of reflection on conditions that pre-exist our practices, our disciplines, our professions, and that we continue to be haunted by in some ways. I mean, I have the sense in both papers of some sense of original sin. You know, there's something that we're not gonna get out of this room uh, without dealing with. And at the same moment, it leads me to wonder, is there any potential for emancipation? Is there any potential for transcendence? Can we get out of these? I mean, haunted is maybe one uh, way of framing it, but both in the context of the, the violence of the, of the grid and its imposition of, of, of law through space and the violence of the material conditions, um, you know, um, I'm coming away feeling as though there may not be much hope for us. I, I, what, a couple of years ago, I was test driving a formulation in this building to try to come back to our relationship to planning, you know? And I, I had this formulation for a while that was, you know, the design disciplines, we sort of, we, we work through material and space and we use grids and we use mat matter. And that somehow planning in the kind of modern sense, especially in the North American context, has become kind of a, a conscience or a kind of super ego for the design disciplines. All of my planning friends frowned at this and so I stopped using it. But I want to invoke it here um, to, Put on the table planning for a moment in light of our future conversations this afternoon, but also to suggest that perhaps, even though both papers and both of your practices have really explored the conditions for autonomy and the, the role of you know, architecture as a kind of cultural form, in both cases we see evidence, both in the work but also in your remarks today, of a kind of internal reflection on or set of reflections on these conditions that were haunted by. And that strikes me as maybe a productive way forward, given if, if, I'm, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm onto something, let, let me know if I've misread that. But I think on the one hand, both papers are focusing on the idea of these original conditions without which it's not clear we have a field anymore. Let's start there. And so I'll put it to you both as a question. 
is it possible to have something like architecture absent our material sins? Is it something, is it something we can imagine architecture absent the grid and the legal structures and the violence that, uh, that it brings? Um, yes, um, I think uh, that's uh, what I, I hope, hopefully I try to argue is that uh, even though the grid has become such a dominant, I mean, the grid, but also geometry itself has become a, such a dominant um, paradigm in, in, the, in the evolution of our historical evolution of our discipline, actually there are a lot of cultures and um, civilizations that have resisted that kind of uh, understanding of space. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, of course, the problem is that our disciplinary knowledge of architecture is very geared to the kind of colonial history of architecture itself. And perhaps what I tried to, I offered, uh, I offered this genealogy not to say, you know, we should just go on business as usual, mm -hmm. but to precisely question the way in which even the most uh, fundamental aspects of our discipline are completely have evolved by being geared to this kind of uh, impetus of colonization. I mean, that's why I put the provocation on the table that the history of planning, and to a certain extent, the history of architecture is a history of colonialism. Mm -hmm. And every building, I would argue, is in one way or another uh, a form of colonialism, of space. But there are actually a lot of cultures, and actually it's very interesting to study especially this transition uh, uh, between uh, the formation of sedentary life, because it's really at that point that one sees a lot of interesting experiments that were not immediately subsumed by what later on becomes the, form the formation of what we can call the pre-modern formation of state, of state planning. So in that sense, I think going back to those precedents, of course, one will not have answers for the future for sure, but somehow a clue that uh, that, that, that ownership is an hist historically situated uh, category and that there is room for other forms of coexistence which are, as, you, as I argue, are based on use, are based on custom and not on the legal uh, system of, of the state and of property. Mm. I mean, the paper gives, I think, a very compelling account, a kind of anthropological um, reading of the embeddedness of legal structures, but also kind of spatial structures in um, agriculture, the development of, you know, the accounting and sort of the grid as kind of spatial expression as spreadsheet, right? Um, the question I've got for you is, is there a moment in time, and I suppose we, we could ask uh, Niran the same question, either in terms of the grid or the material conditions, is there any possibility that after some number of millennia, there are other forms that are possible, or is it possible for the grid to signify otherwise? Mm -hmm. So of course there have been, you, you know as well as anyone in the room, moments in which architecture has taken the grid to a level of abstraction and radically depoliticized it. And I mean, a part of what I'm taking your comments to suggest this morning is that that's really a kind of impossible trajectory. Uh, but is there any potential in that? Is, is it possible for us, or is it by definition that we have to uh, be um, post, post the grid? No, I, I, I really think that both the grid and especially abstraction, I, I really believe that abstraction, uh, it's not an invention of, uh, of capitalism or, or even economy, it's, it's a property of the human mind. The problem is that in certain uh, civilizations, which unfortunately ended up becoming kind of hegemonic in the colonization of the world, uh, abstraction became the support of a certain kind of way to think social relationships, which are profoundly based on uh, patrimonial and economic uh, values. But there are actually other civilizations where the idea of abstraction uh, was, on the contrary, not geared to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that for me, if there is, if I can give a very, you know, if one asked me to give a, a rough uh, definition of socialism, I would argue it's the reclaiming of abstraction, not for uh, financial and economic uh, purposes. I think that's for me the one of the biggest projects. And of course the grid is the same. The grid actually exists in many other cultures. I mean it's not an invention of the south uh, uh, western uh, the middle uh, the, of the of the near east or the fertile crescent. I mean the grid appear actually in many other uh, 
civilizations, but it's actually in one specific lineage, which I tried to <laughs> illustrate, that, 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 that the grid becomes a means of subdivision. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a Renaissance uh, architecture, whether it's colonial uh, urbanism in the US, whether are the Bastides in France, the grid is not used as a kind of, uh, even, even, it's not even used as a formal device. It's really used as, a, as an instrument of subdivision. We shouldn't forget that uh, uh, it's not true that uh, you know, Italian Renaissance invented perspective. I mean, it's one of the fundamental mistake. Uh, perspective was invented by Arab culture, mm -hmm. but uh, when it came to Europe, uh, it not only actually became an instrument of visualization, which was not actually the case in the Arab invention of perspective, but became an instrument of measuring land and actually giving financial, let's say, value uh, to, to the land. When actually land became a commodity, you need, in order to make it a commodity, you need to measure it and you need to transform, uh, to gear actually geometry to the reification of land as a, mm. As, a, as an economic asset. So it's there that the whole problem starts. And I think that all the problems that we are witnessing today, which is really the collapse of this uh, you know, empire based on this violence of appropriation, ha have the roots uh, in this kind of process. So mm -hmm. in order to understand what would be an, in an emancipatory project for architecture, I think we need to address those histories without the fear to put uh, at stake uh, uh, our own discipline. Mm -hmm. Very powerfully put. Uh, we're going to open now to questions, please. Yeah. To put it mildly, I'm in complete disagreement with everything that uh, Charles said and uh, most of what uh, uh, our lecturer said about the grid. I'm a champion of the grid. And I think, uh, going back to what we heard from the chairman before, that the grid is the one form that, uh, the one form of urban design which can be done at scale. That's not like a little project of a few block, but when you saw the 1785 uh, Jefferson plan, it extends all the way from the Ohio River to Los Angeles. And so uh, we have only, a few decades left before the end of the urbanization project. By 2100, most of urbanization is going to be pretty much complete. And we have these 70 or 80 years to prepare ourselves for urbanizing another 2.5 billion people, mostly in the developing countries. We have very little planning capacity to prepare these cities for uh, urbanization, and the grid is the one thing that we can do to make these cities more orderly and better organized and more accessible uh, to jobs and less uh, vulnerable to being slums. Uh, let me give a couple of examples. Um, a, a new paper uh, on uh, World Bank projects in Tanzania a study two kinds of projects, a sites and services projects that were gridded and slum upgrading projects where people brought in infrastructure to a uh, randomly developed uh, slum. Uh, the, the slum upgrading projects, land values, uh, house values increased by 30% over that period. In the gridded part, they increased by 170%. Uh, uh, that sounds to me like evidence of the point made in the paper. Do yes. we have a question yes. anywhere in the near future? Uh, I can phrase this as a question. Uh, you know, we're smart enough to do that, but I just wanted to, uh, to question. Uh, the grid is, and if you read the uh, Adrian Gorelick, let's say El Grille y El Parque, is a democratizing element. It makes the poor and the rich live in the same framework rather than, uh, so I don't understand, the thing that I don't understand is where do you get this uh, negative attitude about this? Yeah. You know, where do you get this, uh, you know, <laughs> yes, you. so we that. colonize space by, by having cities expand, but that's what we do. That's the nature of, of the work that, these, that, uh, that we all do. So why use words such as colonizing, 
uh, negative. The, and the one final question, with Charles, it, is uh, we're not going to. Once these streets get put up, they never disappear. You know, they stay there for hundreds and thousands of years. So, it, so I question. Uh, the agenda. What is the agenda here? What are you trying to suggest? So is there another direction that we should take? Because I feel very comfortable with this idea of continuing to develop cities in the way that they have been developed before. Can I, can I add, like, let's take like, one at a time because I think that was a pretty lengthy, you know, kind of tabling of a set of ideas. So I just want to give our I want to give our panelists an opportunity to respond. I feel like I'm really sure. You should. I think it's a great question. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, I'm also a big fan of the grid. Um, but actually, uh, you know, when I started to do research many years ago, uh, I have the fortune to meet a very good professor who told me, you know, the purpose of research is killing your darlings. Uh, but not in a kind of nihilistic way. I mean, in a way that you somehow really become very aware uh, where the things you actually use and, and work with uh, come from. And, and in fact, uh, um, one of the, actually one of the uh, parts that I, 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 I had to omit from the presentation that would answer your question very well uh, is really the, the role of Hippodamus in the, in the whole story. Because uh, you know, it's not true that Hippodamus invented the grid. I mean, this is another urban legend uh, that is not true. But he actually gave a very interesting interpretation of the grid. Uh, so he acknowledged that uh, basically the, the reason why Greeks were and founding cities you know, through the gridiron was because colonization actually was a very risky business. So they had to actually reward uh, in, you know, in an equal way those who actually took part in this process. And that's actually why you know, the whole idea of Greek democracy uh, or the concept of isonomia uh, became so pre important in Greek civilization, especially in the, in, the fifth, uh, in the fifth century BC. However, when you actually read uh, how Hippodamus organized the Greek, we know that uh, through uh, these, famous, these two famous passages from Aristotle, he said, well, you know, first you, you have to plan the city as a grid because the grid is a very equal system of distribution. But you should be very careful about land use uh, because uh, soldiers, uh, they should uh, rely on the common land. Uh, farmers should have their own land. Uh, and uh, uh, artisan, they should, be, they should be landless. They should rely only on farmers. So what he actually does, he's taking the egalitarian, let's say, order of the grid uh, as an instrument of subdivision where the whole actually uh, principle of property can be established. Uh, in fact, creating a de facto very strong power uh, relationships, because of course it's, uh, it's immediately clear that the farmers and soldiers are the most important uh, citizens because artisans actually are landless. So for me, this is just an example, and I can give you even many other examples of how the grid, of course, has to a certain extent this kind of impetus of let's call it social equality. Uh, the Bastides were uh, also arguing that in that way, the Dutch actually uh, use of the grid in their colonial cities, but also in Holland was often argued with this kind of idea of Republican equality. But in fact, in reality, in the way actually the abstraction of the grid allowed this uh, you know, uh, manipulation of property rights, uh, it always disrupted. This, uh, this system of equality. So for me, that is really something, I, I think the grid, in a way, yes, it's absolutely powerful as a way to give order to space. But we should be aware that uh, you know, there were all these kind of aspects uh, that have made the grid uh, a very tricky uh, urban form. Neil. Yeah. Great. Yes, yeah, so fantastic panel. Great start to the day. Um, one question for Neron, one for Pierre Vittorio. So for Neron, extremely fascinating um, analysis. And I interpret your work as kind of defetishizing architecture in a certain way, so that we have to look at some of the um, materials flow, material flows that underpin the artifact instead of just reifying the artifact. So by juxtaposing the formed architectural artifact to the actual materiality that results from resource extraction and so forth. So I find that incredibly powerful. But my question is, 
I'm also struck by, at least in the projects that you shared with us today, a kind of absence of the metabolic rifts, the labor geographies, the dynamics of social power relations that actually mediate the, the material juxtapositions that you're representing, which in principle, one could layer into some of the visualizations. And I just wondered if you could tell us more about, because I think, I assume that was a very reflexive decision, because you're obviously deeply embedded in those literatures. And I'm just, I, I'd love to hear more about your, the intellectual logic behind that visualization strategy. For Pierre Vittorio, in some ways, my reflections are connected to what Sally just said. I'm also struggling with the particular history of the grid. That it's very provocative, and each moment in your typology is connected to different social formations. So you were very clear in connecting it to social formation and also to metabolism, because all of these grids are connected to different ways of reproducing life. So it's, it's not just a pure typology. It's a typological approach to thinking about social, long durée social history. But, so I have two buts. One is, don't we still need, and this connects to part of what Sally was saying, don't we still need to, to really historicize the grid? So I fully agree abstraction predates capitalism, the grid predates capitalism, but surely with capitalist industrialization, something that you've obviously written so much about, there's, there are some structural shifts in the nature of the production of space, the function of the grid within broader urbanization processes. And don't we need to think about that in terms of also thinking about possible alternative ways of organizing socially, politically, et cetera, the grid? But the other but, so that's one but, and the other but is, so I'm really um, not convinced. You, you came to the island at the very end, and you did you know, give us the disclaimer, this is the beginning of a broader project. So we obviously all look forward to seeing where it's going to go. But here's some, some critical reactions. So number one, I, I am not convinced that the island is necessarily progressive. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think there's a strong danger with island geographies of you know, the David Harvey militant particularism problem, yeah. that it could be a completely reactionary localism. Yeah. So how do you deal with that, number yeah. one? And number two, the islands, it's one thing to talk about an island in the Middle Ages or in ancient Greece, but we're talking about islands mm. in early 21st century yeah. capitalism. Let's of just course. call it capitalism. It's not only capitalism, but it's, okay? So if, if you're talking about islands in a framework mm. of the gridding of the planet, mm. then um, it's not just an island. Yeah. So Standing Rock, I don't even know if that's an island. No, because not. I think it's a, it's a barricade mm. in a very transcontinental logistical grid. Yeah. And it's about using the blockade as a strategy to interrupt the planetary metabolism of capital related to fossil fuels, which is also articulated to a project of indigenous sovereignty. Yeah. Yeah. So, so reducing it just to an island, I think, is also potentially limiting as a way to understand emergent yeah, political yeah. strategies. Absolutely. The question of labor, I, I think um, the, the, somehow the, there is a deliberate kind of choice here where, first of all, when I presented the project, I deliberately used the term more than visualization. It was actually not visualization first. And I thought not visualization might, as a title might lead to a kind of <coughs> confusion in the kind of understanding of the work. Um, so I am using visual means, and there are obviously visual uh, discussions going on, but I'm not, I don't want the project to be about visualization of facts. So, um, and deliberately at certain parts of the project, there are things that are absent. For instance, there are no humans. You don't see humans, and you only see remnants. You see every day, you see activities. Um, and, and for the Nine Islands project, it was a deliberate choice that in the quarry that was a, there was a lot of labor, a lot of activity going on, but in the, in the places that we associate with, uh, with, the, with the everyday, with the building, there are no humans, but exhaustively there are activities. So they were, they were, there were the representational kind of choices on the part of the project to make that absent um, just for, uh, I'm gonna use the term abstraction for a different way, I guess, 
but um, somehow delete or slow down, right, the kind of high expediency of delivery in terms of visuals. When because I that was the argument I was trying to make that somehow um, the when you take out certain aspects from the project, you have to imagine that, for instance, in this case, maybe labor or where are the humans? What happens in between when you juxtapose that finished product, the finished let's say, monument at the top and the formless land mass, you have to think about the in-between. So there were deliberate decisions about abstraction, about deleting, about slowing things down. If the violence that, that we're seeing around us is slow, as mentioned by some other uh, kind of uh, humanists, slow violence, let's say the representations themselves are also slowed down. They, it just really requires engagement from the user's part to, to understand. It's, it doesn't give you the message really directly. So I have to say there are deliberate choices in terms of uh, deleting information rather than exhaustively adding on. Well, first of all, thanks a lot for the questions which are really uh, crucial. Um, the first one, um, yes, I completely agree with you that uh, we need to historicalize the grid and not treat it as a kind of universal uh, principle. I hope this is really what I was trying uh, to do uh, with my paper. And maybe, I, I mean, of course, I had to compress and have to delete many subtleties that I think are really crucial passages to avoid this kind of diffusionist uh, universalizing narrative. But uh, I was also maybe overreacting to a lot of narratives of modernity that usually sees the birth of capitalism <coughs> happening all of the sudden in a, in a moment in history. And recently I became extremely interested, especially uh, in, in the, that period, you know, conventionally called Middle Age. Um, and of course there are many interpretations that we can make of that period, but I think uh, from the point of view of my interest in property and ownership, uh, there is actually a conflict uh, at the time, which is very interesting, uh, between two modes of territorial organization. I mean, one uh, which is actually what, you know, can be represented by the so-called Italian Comune, uh, which was basically a system of self-governance, which actually had a relationship to outside, actually were very, very interesting, but had this kind of attempt to really build a republic uh, that was, in fact, local. And then on the, on the other hand, you have the beginning of the state, and uh, which actually becomes really the fundamental um, legal um, habitat in which actually capitalism flourish. Uh, and it's a really interesting fight, uh, you know, both, especially in, in Italy, in France, there is really a constant fight between these two uh, modes of territorial organization until actually the, 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 the Black Plague, when in fact the model, uh, the larger model uh, of territorial governance be, you know, becomes actually more, more important. I mean, I'm, I'm now really compressing something that is much slower and much more complex. And, and so what is interesting is that in that fight, uh, suddenly uh, uh, what becomes I I important for architects, uh, for humanists, for lawyers, is actually the legacy of Roman law. Uh, and the way in which actually Roman law was instrumentalized in the kind of imperial expansion of the Roman Empire, and in fact how that kind of modus operandi is in fact a, a legacy of ancient uh, urbanism, especially the, the one that goes from uh, the Near East to the, to the Greek uh, civilization. So I'm really interested in connecting these dots uh, and trying to argue how, you know, there is a moment in history where we could have gone in a completely different way, uh, which, uh, of course, maybe it's too premature to call the island. Uh, and I completely agree with you that uh, there is a danger of uh, falling into a lot of narratives that I think are extremely problematic. But I also think uh, that uh, there is a possibility to reclaim that paradigm from the way in which, uh, especially with the formation of the state, the island has been reduced. In fact, before the formation of the state, Islands were centers of culture, uh, of exchange, uh, which are, were incredibly rich. Um, and I think that with the, with the rise of the state, the island actually assumes a completely different connotation, which is, becomes 
more and more uh, regressive and more problematic. But the question is really how to reclaim that legacy uh, and to imagine the island not really as a, literally as, as the island, but really as the possibility to open a gap or a dialectic between the local empowerment and the uh, planetary or you know, large scale machinery that actually govern us. Not, not to undo that machinery, because it's even impossible, but to gradually erode that kind of machinery. So in that sense, the island for me is not an autonomous uh, cluster, but it's really a dialectical principle. It's helpful. It's, it strikes me that, I mean, among the challenges of the island um, is that it has often, so often been the place of, you know, final exile for the, you know, the things being removed <laughs> as well, right? So I think it's, it's, uh, it cuts in both directions. I think um, Alex was next, and then we'll go down. Uh, in his book, he mentions that the, the, the laws of property and ownership in this country block every aspiration that we have, many of the aspirations that we have and that we're talking about. And the grid, I think, when you are speaking of it, is, is becoming um, an agent or a tool of these restrictions, these laws that, that have been made for whatever purpose, but at the moment block us for where we want to go. So uh, when he speaks, there is a, a theme lurking, uh, ready to explode out of the last chapter of his book, which is uh, what is a form of democracy for the Anthropocene. And that is the concept, the emerging uh, concept of the commons that uh, uh, large-scale forms of government are unable to deal with issues, various issues. They can't uh, reach the aspirations of communities, and that the idea of the commons is, having, uh, is coming back as a way of local areas controlling their environment, uh, even business, even housing, even services in cities. And so I interpret, or, or wondered if we could interpret islands as commons, and that within the grid there could be this array of self-organizing, self-determining uh, freedoms, which would then support the, the initial uh, potential of the grid, as Shlomo Angel uh, laid it out. I think it's a really interesting uh, linkage also for probably between the presentations as well. And I, um, uh, I mean, it's an anecdotal response, but I had in my, one of my classes, uh, my students read the book, the Jedediah Perez, the entire book. And um, uh, obviously it's an architectural and design context, but um, I, I think that your reading of Purdy is very generous because uh, somehow, and because of all, again, he's a—I mean—he's not a political theorist. He's more of a law professor coming from law, but he's really using William Cronin uh, as a way of understanding the hinterland. And um, in the end, in our discussions, always and always, Purdy was not enough. There was—it's almost his critique or his framework has always been: yes, he's proposing the comments. He's actually more looking for a another kind of democracy in the context of Anthropocene. That is the kind of crux of the book. Um, but somehow in my students, maybe it is my students and maybe other students would not get to that conclusion, but that there was a dissatisfaction of, as a way of showing another way. So that what, what, is, what is really the, how do we get out of it? How do, we, how do we do that? But I think somehow thinking of, I mean, I don't know how Jedediah Purdy would respond to the, to the kind of grid and the island. Actually, that would be an interesting conversation, which I think um, he is looking for a, I, I don't, because we are designers, we do have a certain kind of framework, spatial organizations in our minds, and he's could be actually a little bit more theoretical. But I think he would be sympathetic to the idea of another kind of spatial governance, another form of spatial framework that would allow an, a, a, that alternative democracy. And I think what's interesting about thinking of the island, perhaps, as in terms of its, let's say, common quality, commons, rather than the private, is it almost like negates or inverses its 
already existing dialectic, which is usually the private, let's say, geisha community, or something that's even more private than the grid, and almost like inverting that logic with an extreme kind of upside down condition. But we should have the idea of Purdy to give maybe like that response in that way. Well, I, I think actually a topic that I didn't want to bring on my presentation because I think there was already enough things to discuss, but um, is really the, uh, the practice of commoning. And there is actually a very interesting uh, researcher. Um, his name is Massimo De Angelis, uh, um, who actually just published last year a book called Omnia Sunt Comunia. I, I, strong, I mean, whoever is interested in commoning, this is the book <laughs> that I think is really a substantial contribution to this discussion. And something that he said that I think is really important, that commoning uh, always imply a boundary. In other words, uh, it's very difficult to commoning without creating actually a, a dialectic between inside and, and outside. And in fact, uh, if you go back to these uh, situations I was trying to describe, like for example, the Acampada, but also actually Occupy Wall Street, uh, for me actually, you know, what is really interesting about those experiments that in, in order to establish this you know, new forms of dwelling, they had to establish some rule of exclusion. For example, both in the Acampada and the Occupy, a certain kind of language was forbidden. Uh, and I think that this is actually why the boundary becomes actually a very interesting object, uh, both actually as a mental, but also as a, as a physical boundary, because we know that in many civilizations, making boundaries was a fundamental way to, to, to construct a, an intelligible relationship between uh, people and their land. And, and boundary was not a means of exclusion, but a means of regulating and, and, and in a way constructing an understanding of land. So for me, that, that is really a fundamental project to, to, to recuperate uh, against actually this completely perverted uh, idea of boundary as a legal, um, as a legal instrument uh, which of course is very obvious when it comes in the form of the gate community or the detention camp, which is horrific, of course, uh, forms of island urbanism. But it's less obvious when it comes to the very subdivision of the city. Uh, I mean, this room, in a way, in one way or another, is an enclosure. Uh, the spaces that we inhabit are forms of enclosures, constantly regulated by right uh, to property. Uh, so in that sense, commoning means to imagine a different kind of boundaries. And of course, I remain committed to, to architecture. So for me, the, the question is how architecture, after centuries, providing actually the form to, to, to titles of ownership, you know, how architecture can envision a different idea of, of city and coexistence. There's um, plenty on the table already for this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to go to Diane Davis for the last question. It seems now we've broached camp and encampment. We also have to spend some time on that maybe later today. Diane. OK, thank you, Charles. It's kind of a comment and not a question, maybe. <laughs> well, That's OK. okay. Um, for you. Yeah, so only because I think it will inspire more um, responses in the afternoon. But I guess I just wanted to say, I mean, I very much appreciate the provocation of the grid versus the island, Pier Vittorio. So I think it's this is a very rich conversation. I guess I just want to caution against reifying physical form. Mm -hmm. So yeah. n not put us in this totalizing position where we say it's the grid or it's not the grid. Yeah, That's what yeah, Shlomo is saying. Um, and I think that we have to remember that these spatial forms, the grid and the island, and I will say a little, a second, something very quickly, what I hear and feel when you talk about an island, um, that they have, they do different, they, they perform different functions, social, politically, economically, and that's where the human and institutions all make them what they are. So, I mean, I think it's super important in this room not to reify a particular form, because we do that in architecture and design. You do X because it, it solves all these problems. What really appeals to me about the concept of the island, because I work in the developing world, I work in, in big urbanizing cities in the global south. To me, it's the debate about formality and informality, which is another way to come into this. So formality is about modernism, and the grid is part of that, and the rule of law and private property is all the struggle. 
And there is a way in which informality, spaces of informality, the islands that you're talking about. But that doesn't answer the problem for us because spaces of informality can be hugely liberating and autonomous. But spaces of informality can, can reproduce power structures and capitalism also, but in a very different form, and maybe less controlled by the law and the state. So it all depends on the conditions under which whose law, whose state, whose control, whose capitalism do you want, right? So um, I, one last example. So I work in, an, in Mexico City, and there's a neighborhood in Mexico City called Tepito, where they consciously, the, uh, the autonomy of the neighborhood struggled against the gridding of the place. They didn't, and, and who gets in and out, and there's, there are no grids, et cetera. But that, in a way, was a kind of a countervailing control against the police to come in and introduce order in a place of total disorder. So disorder can be a very liberating and emancipatory, maybe even a social project, socialist project, but it can also be a hugely oppressive project. And I think we just want to understand the times, the places that we want to look at the flexibility of the island versus the fixity of the grid. And we as designers to think about that just, not just as a spatial project, but as a social project as well. Can, can we say maybe yes? No, or you, maybe they should have the final word if they want. Um, actually, I completely agree with you that, uh, I mean, this is really the problem usually when um, I discuss with architects about, you know, what I would call urban paradigms that you know, the next thing, okay, let's find immediately something that fits mm -hmm. that thing. And I think that takes a lot of time. And we, we know from history that the formations of certain urban forms actually is the consequence of very long-term social processes. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, Meissen before was saying something that I think is really important in the discussion about form. I mean, today, actually, unfortunately, this term uh, means only one thing. But uh, in other languages, and actually even in the Greek Latin uh, etymology of the word, there were a var I mean, there was an entire semantic field in which the word form would resonate, and it was not only about physical mm -hmm. things, but also the structure of things. I mean, the famous distinction between morphe and eidos. But actually, it's interesting. The word form, the Latin word form, actually were the tablets, where property lines were recorded and archived. So in a way, so th there is actually a whole richness of this word uh, that unfortunately in our own language has been so impoverished. Uh, and that's actually why, I, as I mentioned in my presentation, also this question of rituals, uh, which I think are an extremely important legacy of the history of urban form, is a fundamental way to rethink actually urban form, a way of this kind of you know, shape uh, making, uh, which of course is important. I mean, as architects, at the end, we produce uh, physical forms, but they actually are part of this dialectic uh, that cannot be immediately narrowed down to, you know, if I talk about islands, so here is the, the formal, uh, you know, thing. I, I, I always have, I always try to reject that kind of easy uh, translation, but I think we need to reflect and 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 enrich the the meaning of form beyond the the what you said the reification into the into one specific idea of form which is basically the the object. Our um, our conveners have invited us to uh, reconvene at one ten, very precisely. Uh, Neyran Turan, Pier Vittori Aureli. Thank you.